This is a very special event as for different reasons. First reason, we have gathered the four different associations, uh, uh, namely uh, NextPA, uh, which focuses uh, on uh, government and public administration, and European Generation, which covers issues related to European integration, uh, Bocconi Economics Student Association, which is the uh, most important uh, uh, association for economics for, inter for international students, and then finally Eco del Bunker, which is a, a, an independent a, a newspaper of, by students for students. Uh, so I want to thank all the members of this association, of these associations, who helped us organizing this event. And uh, the second reason for which this event is important is that uh, we are heading towards the European elections. So it is important to understand the architecture of the European Union, to vote uh, with awareness, and if you are not a European citizen, to understand the uh, develop political and the economic development of the Euro area and of the European Union. Uh, finally, um, uh, this is an important event as we have got uh, uh, very important speakers. I, I would like to um, uh, express my gratitude, uh, first of all, to Massimo Amato, who agreed to moderate our event, uh, then to Franco Baluni, who is uh, ISP Vice President, and uh, Professor Albuconi, and uh, to Sergio Cesanato, uh, who teaches European Economic and Fiscal Policy at Siena University. Uh, and finally, I want to say to you that uh, uh, the event will be structured as a debate. So, finally, you will have the possibility to ask uh, to the professors every question you want about the discussed topic. And uh, I'd like to underline that uh, this is an event organized by students for students. So, for your awareness. Okay? Uh, I hope that you will enjoy the event and thank you for your attention. So, the European Union is a rule-based institution. Uh, for example, there is a rule that prevents governments to uh, go for state aid for firms or organizations uh, without special permissions. Uh, the single market, which is the crucial point uh, around which uh, the Union has been created, provides a, a set of rules including product regulations, uh, etc. Part of the antitrust legislation, this is very huge. Part of the antitrust uh, 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 regulation, which is very important uh, in, in Europe, is rule-based, strictly rule-based, no discretionality. Uh, the 3%, the famous 3% uh, 
rule that prevents deficits of countries to go beyond 3% of GDP. It's also a rule. Fiscal compact is a rule, set of rules. Monetary policy, as you know, uh, has the target 2% inflation, and that's a rule. The European stability mechanism, which is the pool of resources with which we help countries in situations of fiscal disarray, difficulties, it's full of rules, it's a treaty in itself. Uh, the no bailout rule that prevents to bail out countries or banks, etc., is a rule. Uh, what do we mean by rule based policy? Well, you know that, you know what is the rule of law? The rule of law is the idea that prevails in many advanced countries that uh, citizens have to be governed according to rules. Governments have to issue rules, legislative, have to create rules. And uh, what is dictated to citizens has to be inside a set of rules. But rule-based policies are policies that are in a way highly automatic. They don't allow uh, the, the, gov the, the, the government, the, the, those that observe these policies, that implement these policies, don't allow a lot of discretionary. Basically, in normal times, in normal uh, in domestic rules, etc., you have a lot of discretionary. You have the rule of law, but the law grants a substantial amount of discretionality to those that apply the law, okay? In the case of rule-based policies, this is much less evident. There is a, a lot of rigidity in the rules that are applied. Now, obviously, the reason is that if you want discretion, you have to have democratic accountability. If you take discretionary decisions, uh, you, you have to be backed by a democratic uh, set of institutions like parliament, etc., that really represent the, the, the population that then has to be, uh, has to be subject to the rules. Uh, if the discretionality is not, uh, if the democratic accountability is insufficient, then the only way to exert policies is via fixed rules in a way that are. Uh, agreed once and for all, uh, and then applied automatically. Uh, in a way, rule-based po policies are less efficient and just than policies that can rely on discretionality, because you you are prevented to make differences, to adapt the rules to situations with different kind of, of people, of terms, of countries, of times, etc. So your, your action is less, uh, in a way, efficient and, and often less just. So we would like to move towards more discretion, which in Europe, this would, and this in Europe would imply to move towards increasing political unity and like a federation, something that really makes Europe a highly uh, uh, integrated uh, political institution, very big organization where uh, something like a federal state where you can really rely on democratic accountability. However, several now this is a target that we cannot but see very fine in, in, you know, in the future because we know that there is a lot of nationalism around and not everybody is convinced that Europe should get together and become a federal state. So, uh, in the meantime, we have to stick to a much less unified Europe, so we have to stick to some rule-based policies. And moreover, there are several reasons that might suggest to restrict discretion, uh, even in, for the interest of individual countries, and in particular restrict discretion with international rules. So in a way to tie your hands uh, by uh, committing our decisions to some kind of international treaty. Why 
are <coughs> what are these regions that can favor rule-based and uh, rule-based international community? Well, first of all, you have global public goods, say climate. You have to push your policies to improve climate, to you know, decrease pollution, things like that. Okay, this is a global issue that has to be pushed by all countries in the world. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. And there's no way to have a democratic accountability at the global level. You can you know, have a lot of rhetoric about the United Nations, things like that, but basically nobody believes that there is any democratic accountability in managing uh, the governance of the world. Well, in this case, we need fixed rules, which are less than perfect, obviously, because, for instance, they impose to all the countries the same kind of adjustments to, say, pollution or other uh, things, you know, population growth, or, which is less than what we desire. I mean, the best thing, the, the optimum for the world would be a much more diversified and flexible legislation for every kind of global public good. But given that it has to be pushed at the global level, we have to rely on rather fixed rules. And, uh, and in a way, it's either in or out. And this is also the fragility of these global uh, agreements, because you see, when somebody doesn't like the rules that are issued, he, the only thing he can do is just drop out. But if it drops out, the whole the whole construction of the, the whole push, uh, 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 the whole uh, effort to, to, to get to the production of the public good uh, uh, enters into the There are also political theories that consider discretion as a bridge to freedom. Some of these political theories have very noble origins, say, you know, in the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. The idea is that if you are governed by P, by an in, in, in individual, two individuals, three individuals, a group of individuals, a majority, in any case, this is going to breach your, your freedom. The only way to be governed without, in total freedom, is to be governed by rules, anonymous rules, rules that have been agreed upon once and for, forever, say the constitution, things like that, that a very large majority, possibly everybody, and then you have the rule, and then everybody uh, obeys to the rule, and, and for the rest, freedom. Obviously, the room for freedom in this, uh, in this picture has to be very, very large, because, because it's very difficult to fix rules for everything. So this means that the number of rules that will prevail, that will be created, is going to be very small. So if you are a libertarian, you tend to, you tend to like a world where the, you have a small amount of fixed rules, and then you can do what you want. <coughs> well, this is the extremist view your so-called normal liberalism, but uh, there are several ways of approaching this kind of idea and ideology, and therefore today there are many, uh, many political forces, many, many ideologies, many countries, many tradi political traditions that tend to uh, favor uh, less discretion than more rules. Um, we could talk about incomplete political contracts here, which are very similar to what in economics are called incomplete economic contracts. Uh, well, moreover, national discretion can cause problems. First of all, uh, you have the prisoner's dilemma and the possibility that as, when you have a lot of national discretion, <coughs> This discussion is used in an aggressive way, way towards the rest of the world. And so in the rest of the world we will, will, uh, will imitate you. We'll, uh, so at the end you have a, a world which is uh, full of uh, contrasts and it's much less than optimal. Uh, 
This is why we try to reach international treaties that are fixed rules. Uh, moreover, discretion has a bias towards short-termism because normally discretion is administered by politicians that look at the next elections. So they tend to be short-termism. Moreover, by definition, discretion is a source of uncertainty. You don't know what the guy will do. He has discretion, can do strange things. And, uh, and sometimes his discretion, it is uncertainty is very serious because it's radical. That is, it cannot even be, you can not even associate probabilities with the different possibilities. So you are totally uncertain, confused, you don't know what to do. So you don't invest, you don't consume, you are, you are troubled in your relationship with organizations, with other people, etc. Discretion is also highly biased towards majorities, obviously, because it's based on majoritarian rule. But this can be a problem for minorities. Moreover, there is the important issue of time inconsistency. If you, if you have a lot of discretion as a policy, as a, as a, as a, policy maker, you tend to make announcements and take commitments, and then when time comes to apply what you have decided and announced, you don't do it because incentives in the meantime have changed and you do differently, you, you behave differently from what, from what you have promised to do. This creates a lot, a, a lot of uh, mm, a loss of credibility, basically. And often, government, govern, national governments, lose credibility because they are clearly time inconsistent. They say something and they don't do what they say. So, so in a way, tying your hands with an international or national sometimes a fixed rule that cannot be changed in any way because you have committed to it, or at least a rule that, that can be changed but with a very high political cost. This helps you to be credible because when you, as a politician, when you say something and you set down your plans, you set down your program, you have to stick to it because as if, you, if, you, if you act differently, you have to pay a very high political cost. And international treaties are especially made to increase this cost very, very much. So the role of international rule is important, the role of external discipline, which is uh, which is the, the, the reason for these uh, international rules, uh, uh, and the role of the advantage of times one says is often important. Let me now say something uh, uh, on macro fiscal rules. I don't know if you know this guy. Probably nobody knows him. Uh, Monsieur Abbe. Uh, this was a functionary of the French. Uh, Treasury, and uh, he was the inventor of the famous 3% rule that limits the deficit to GDP ratio uh, of countries in the Maastricht Treaty. But this was invented in 1981, 10 years before the Maastricht Treaty was even thought. Uh, we had uh, Jean-Claude Jean Trichet at the ESP the other day he told us uh, in detail the story of how this guy invented the 3% rule in, in a situation where France was uh, in need of some fiscal order, etc., etc., and then the French diplomacy uh, managed to propose this three percent when the Maastricht Treaty was discussed, and then it was accepted by Germany, and uh, uh, that was okay. And in fact, everything started with the three percent, sixty percent combination of the Maastricht Treaty. You know, uh, the deficit uh, of uh, countries in the Eurozone cannot go in the European Union by this cannot go beyond 3% of GDP, except there are certain exceptions, uh, and no uh, and the total debt to GDP ratio cannot go above 60 percent. Well, uh, this was I, I remember when this was introduced, I was teaching uh, international macro and I had to explain this to students, but not only to students, so around. And the explanation was sort of strange because the explanation was 
You know why? Well, because, because if you don't, if you cannot print your own currency, uh, you, you can increase your debt in a currency that, denominating in a currency that you cannot print. And your debt can increase to the point of uh, allowing you to blackmail the rest of the euro area, saying, look, if you don't pay my debts, if you, if you don't uh, help me out of my fi financial problems, I will default on my debts. And given that we, we have a lot of financial interrelations, my default will have a big cost also for you. So you have to help me out of my problems. In order to avoid this uh, potential blackmail, uh, there is this 3%, 6% rule. So this was the unwritten explanation of this rule. That was not written, but it was politically well known as the big. But it was funny. When I was teaching these things, nobody would make sense of it, because the idea of a European country having a default problem was totally out of I saw it. People would say, okay, that's a little story, but it's totally irrelevant. Today we know that even highly developed European country can have a serious risk of default. We had at least one European country that defaulted three times. Um, well, first period, which uh, 3% was chosen, then 60% was a consequence. If you expect a 5% growth in nominal income, that is in inflation plus real growth, 60% uh, uh, can be stabilized if you have a 3% uh, uh, deficit each year. That is a, a arithmetical uh, proof here, but uh, I don't want to take the time for this. Well, that was the starting point, but it didn't work very well. In 2003, that is just four years after the start of the euro, uh, we had problems of uh, discipline, fiscal discipline in France and in Germany. France and Germany were out of 3%. Italy was offered its complicity, uh, fishing for future tolerance of Germany towards Italy, and therefore uh, we helped them to stay out of the rule for a substantial amount of time. Uh, we had for two or three years a lack of discipline all over the, all over the place. And practically, fiscal discipline was suspended for, I would say, three years. Uh, then we produced a reform of the fiscal rules, which turned out to be a tremendous complication. First, not tremendous, then <coughs> Each year, new changes were made to the fiscal rules that made them extremely complex. If I had to teach a, you know, a, a full-size lesson on <coughs> the details of European fiscal rules, this would take me, I think, three lessons. <coughs> I did it once with a friend, but uh, I managed to have my friend working much more than I did. Um, now, uh, I just listed here, yes, I just listed here a set of uh, series of complexity. I, I don't want to spend time now to, to enter into any detail. We, we will have time, and moreover, we have somebody else that will probably explain us something in more detail, but we can, if you are interested, we can go deeper here. We started to regulate the speed with which a country tends to reach the 60% uh, limit if it's above 60% of the debt. Uh, we decided that uh, it was not good to have these deficits already at their upper limit, because if you are at the upper limit, you don't have fiscal space to give a fiscal stimulus when uh, your economy is in need of a stimulus to demand. So you need to be below 3% in such a way that if you need it, you can reach 3% and stimulate the economy. So the idea is, in normal times, countries must go towards zero more than towards 3%. Uh, 
But in order to do this, you have to define deficits in, in new ways. So we started to consider seriously definitions of you know, primary deficit, which is the deficit basically net of interest. But mm, particularly difficult, complex, and controversial is the definition of structural deficit, which is in theory at the core of European fiscal discipline, which is the deficit net of cyclical assets of the fiscal, which is, which is a, highly controversial uh, measure. Then we said, well, we, we need to have exceptions because if a country is in a very, very special situation, it has to, to have an exception. But let's regulate flexibility, which is in a way a contradiction in terms. But we produced an incredibly complex re regulation of flexibility. Um, I will show a couple of them. Um, <coughs> Moreover, given that the set of rules were, were, was complicated, you, we needed to have a discussion between the European Union and each state, and therefore we established also a time frame for this. And there is you know, what we call the European semester, certain dates, uh, today is a date, for instance, in this uh, fixed schedule, countries have to send, uh, to, today is the last day to send a certain type of document. Moreover, we decided that fiscal deficits are a, can be a problem, but they're certainly not the only disequilibrium that a macroeconomy can show. And therefore, we decided to monitor a much wider list of, a uh, much richer list of parameters, including, for instance, uh, the balance of payment, the current account of the balance of payment. And this is where Germany has problems because. Germany has a current account which is out of the rules. <coughs> uh, I don't have time to, to show this, but if you are interested, then we can, we can go uh, through here. These are, these are synthesis of certain rules. Uh, this, for instance, is a set of flexibility clauses, which is extremely rich. And you can see also how much different countries have profited from, this, uh, from these exceptions. This is, goes deeper into one flexibility clause, which is cyclical conditions, very complex. And, uh, uh, and uh, let me skip this. And, uh, my final, this is, I think, my final uh, uh, slide. <coughs> so we have complex rules, very complex rules, with no enforcement powers. Because this is what also we, real, we realize very soon that you can dictate a lot of rules, but what to do if the country doesn't obey the rules? Well, in theory, you can fine the country. But does it make sense to fine a country that has already an excessive deficit? So what to do? Well, if I would express the unofficial logic, which is today in the minds of people involved in these things, both uh, in countries and commission and around the markets, I would say that what we think can work is the complementarity between the rules of the commission monitored by the commission and the decisions of the markets. Markets are basically following commission judgments, or at least this is what could function and could <coughs> serve as a sanction also for those countries that do not comply with the rules. If you don't comply to, with the rules, the markets will punish you by selling your securities and by preventing capital inflows in your country, by taking away liquidity from your country because it, you are considered a bad, a bad guy. So the function of the commission is to sort of say if you are a good or a bad guy and then the, the markets will punish you. Uh, fears, they, they punish you because if they stop financing the deficits, you're out of business and you tend to default, which means that you need, in extreme cases, the, uh, uh, the help of the, uh, of the, uh, of the rest of, of the Eurozone. But this comes with conditionality, so you have functionaries from Europe and other institutions that come in your country and dictate your policy, which is a, a big, a, a bad thing. 
for, for, uh, for your independence. Is there any simplification coming? Uh, well, yes. Uh, there are a lot of thoughts uh, going on. At least two ideas are mm, probably going to have some future. One idea is to concentrate much more on, on the debt, on monitoring debt, forgetting about deficits in a way, and uh, allowing you many things, provided that your debt calculated in a certain way, and in certain flexibility clauses, will go for a prescribed path. And the other one, which is even more simple, is to monitor public expenditure, full stop. In a way, everything starts with public expenditure. Public expenditure can be high. You can finance it either with taxes or with debt. You f if you finance it with debt instead of, of, of taxes, this means that your taxes are low. But if your taxes are low, your income can grow faster, and by having more growth, you can more easily reimburse the debt. So basically, the idea of simplifying things with uh, rules on public expenditure is a strong idea that is making room a lot on in the Commission, and by the way, if you look at the specific recommendations that Italy has received last year, it, they were highly concentrated on monitoring public expenditure. Finally, you have the uh, problem of monetization. You can, you can go into that, and the debt can be transformed into money, and we have the European system of central banks that, have, that, has, that has bought an enormous amount of public debt. So monetization has been largely used. Uh, and it's certainly not a long-term solution because it can help during certain periods, but at the end uh, uh, it's, it's not a solution and you need uh, structural reforms, you need a, an economy which is able to work in a more balanced way and uh, this means uh, adjusting uh, and here we have the big issue and I don't have time to go in because I've exhausted my time but later we can discuss a bit about this famous issue. If you adjust your deficits and your debt, this is part of what is called risk reduction, because you become a less risky country at the global level, okay? The idea is that, okay, you can reduce your risk, but some of this risk in a union must also be shared with other countries. So the problem is, when I can expect the other countries to share a little bit of the risk with me, when can I expect the other countries to help me out of the, my problem situation? Well, there are different theories. One theory is first you adjust, and then we can discuss about sharing. The other theory is no, we have to go parallel because Risk sharing is also helping risk reduction. So I cannot go for risk reduction if you don't uh, share a little bit of risk of that. And then there is another way of thinking, which is my way of thinking, that risk sharing is there anyway, because if Italy goes first, Germany will suffer a lot. So the problem is not to decide uh, to, risk, to share the risks, because the risks are shared in a highly integrated community. The problem is to find the right way to share the risk an orderly and, you know, and clever way to regulate a community where risks are shared by definition. Thank you. Um, I want to start from the, what I call the European Economic Constitution, uh, 
Huh? Okay, you know, I'll uh, fold my way to the final. Uh, additional targets of economic policy are uh, full and finite and price stability. Then, like the other target is the equilibrium of the balance of payment. Uh, what uh, do the European economic constitution say, says about uh, these uh, 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 targets? Uh, well, traditional instruments are monetary policy, fiscal policy, and exchange rate policy. Uh, well, uh, in the European economic constitution, uh, monetary policy has the only uh, target of price stability, with inflation below but close to uh, percent. Uh, fiscal policy, but there is no fiscal policy in the, at least in the European uh, Union as a whole. Uh, the idea is to have uh, balanced budgets, public, uh, balanced public budgets. Uh, who cares of uh, full employment? Uh, well, natural reforms, structural reforms mentioned by Professor Gumi, uh, especially, I mean, to, uh, the idea is to make uh, uh, labor markets more competitive. So, full employment is a something, is an objective, a target to be pursued at the national level. Okay, so we share uh, monetary policy, uh, the price stability is the, main, is the only target, but the main target, uh, fiscal policy is not used, and, uh, national, and uh, full employment is a national uh, issue. Uh, and uh, target. Uh, which is the theoretical background of this analysis? Uh, it's a very rigid version of uh, the dominant the classical theory. And you know very well the, the story that, that they have told you uh, in market economic curses. Uh, the Philip curse is that uh, it is in the program. Monetary policy is ineffective. Probably monetary policy can rise uh, in the short run, but not in the long run. You know the story very well. Better to have an independent central bank. Fiscal policy cuts out uh, private investment. So, uh, monetary policy is ineffective. Uh, uh, especially fiscal uh, monetary policy only generates inflation, which is in the long run. Uh, so, uh, given that, uh, it's better that uh, countries like Italy, with weak governments, as a uh, Professor Cooney said, it's better that they tie their hands giving monetary policy uh, to a foreign central bank, not even to a national independent central bank, but it's better to give it to a foreign uh, independent uh, central bank, so to give up monetary sovereignty. Uh, uh, Italy had, uh, uh, okay, Italy had uh, experienced that these two uh, great uh, central bankers, Guido Gagli and Paolo Baffi, uh, that were not at all uh, uh, FB uh, guys, but uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, they, in the given historical circumstances of Italy, in the, especially in the 70s, they accommodated uh, the Italian higher inflation rate uh, with the permissive, permissive uh, monetary policy and uh, the Italian monetary regime, regime at the end of the 70s and uh, beginning of the 80s changed and uh, uh, through the Italian participation in the European monetary system, the fixed exchange rate system that was the father, so to speak, of the Euro, uh, through this uh, uh, participation, uh, Italy said, okay, we, want, we, we don't want to, be, uh, to repeat the experience of these two uh, governors, president of the Bank of Italy. Uh, and we'll say something more later. Uh, in this theoretical world, uh, there is never a problem of aggregate demand, certainly not in the long period. Uh, there is a natural, natural rate uh, of interest at which all savings are invested. So there is never a problem of aggregate demand. It's people saves, okay, there is, a, there is a natural rate of interest that assures that uh, uh, all savings is just made to invest. What is wrong with this deal? Uh, well, there is one main, this is my favorite, you can criticize my classical theory from many points of view, but this is my favorite criticism. Uh, both in practice and in theory, investment does not depend on the interest rate. Uh, there is a nice post by Paul Krugman that says, uh, okay, 
that uh, investment does not depend on the interest rate, it depends on... I will post this, uh, this presentation on my, in my blog, so you will find it. Uh, there is also a, a, a short bibliography at the end. Uh, so, uh, what Kuban's, uh, so uh, Kuban recognized that the, that the investment does not depend on the interest rate, uh, and but do a little the dirty secret, something not to be told to the students. Okay, the students uh, must told the, uh, the, the wrong story. My favorite uh, criticism of classical theory has to do with Rafa, not uh, uh, Angelo, which is the father, with the son, Piero, that I hope some of you uh, uh, have uh, already know, but probably most of you know only Angelo, Rafa, uh, not uh, Piero. Well, in the, in the 60s, there was a 60s, 70s, there was a great controversy in economics in the main journals of economics that involved the Cambridge UK and Cambridge uh, US, uh, that is the MIT and Cambridge in the UK. Uh, this was an analytical controversy concerning the very fundamentals of neoclassical theory. And uh, Paul Samuelson, the leader of the MIT uh, economists, uh, that included Tobin, uh, Sorov, Morigliani, uh, so the best of the American economists at the time, so in 1966 uh, on the Quarterly Journal of Economics, so we recognized that, uh, well, you can see the Italians that were based in Cambridge were right. And that uh, the foundation of the classical theory, the radical foundation of that, was weak to say the least, are definitely wrong. It's an analytical controversy. So, I mean, I can say, all you have studied, sorry, that we include uh, labor and capital demand curves, Solos model, the Asheroni theorem, monetary ESG models, uh, this is basically wrong, but analytical. Okay, some, some uh, of you is uh, smiling, but I mean, uh, please, uh, at least uh, if, uh, uh, at least uh, try to read some of, the, of these literature, try to uh, know something about this control, it's called analytical, I repeat it, and uh, in which the IMT uh, Paul Summers recognized on knowledge that the uh, uh, British, what we would say, Italian side was right. And I am mean, not a maverick, so I do not uh, uh, want to tell strange stories. Uh, that do, this took place in the best international journals, okay, not uh, uh, in strange uh, uh, journals. So, uh, so, I mean, the idea of, of the Phillips curves, the vertical Phillips curves, in, uh, in effectiveness of monetary policy, I mean, I, I just reject uh, uh, this uh, concept just because they are based on a, on a wrong uh, uh, theoretical basis. Uh, so, the main question with the European Economic Constitution is, uh, uh, is this view of full employment uh, as a national program to be, uh, to be uh, Taken with the labor market facility. And this, uh, this uh, uh, view of vision is pre precisely the opposite of the vision that prevailed uh, in the 50s and uh, uh, 60s and part of the 70s before the monetarist uh, counter revolution. In the Canadian uh, full employment, in this case also the MIT people was in favor of this uh, more Canadian views. Uh, in the declaration of view, full employment is an international question, it's not a national question. Uh, in this view, output depends on, on aggregate demand, not only in the short but also in the long period. Income distribution matters a lot for aggregate demand. No, a few days ago, Larry Sanders, who no, was the vice of Clinton, one of the top American economists, president of Harvard, has admitted that most Canadian economists, the heterodox economists, have been far, far ahead. Uh, in, 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 in seeing the importance of aggregate demand, in seeing the role, the negative role of inequality, because inequality uh, uh, has a negative effect on aggregate demand. Uh, in this Canadian view, monetary fiscal policy cooperate to sustain aggregate demand, that the fiscal dominance is something that they have now, you know, uh, that is seen as a threat in, in the European, uh, by the European elite. Uh, Income policy takes care of inflation. I mean, in the, 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 the standard view, the, the, prevailing, uh, the current prevailing view 
uh, inflation is taken care well by high unemployment, actually. Uh, 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 income policy, which is social compromise, should take care of, uh, of inflation. Uh, this work is very badly in this, especially in the setting. And this, this is one reason why we were looking, we had, uh, look for external business and a discipline that tie your hands uh, mentioned by uh, Professor Gould. Controls over capital flows assure a degree of independence of uh, monetary policy, the Bretton Woods regime, uh, which uh, as uh, Professor Amato, Professor Fantacci has taught us, gains a good part in the design of, of this regime, although I mean his ideas were not uh, uh, fully accepted. And democracy. I mean, elections, I mean, we have, we have heard uh, from Professor Bruni words, uh, I mean, uh, that somebody cannot may, may not appreciate about democracy. I mean, the dictatorship of the majority, of these kind of expressions that now the elites uh, like, uh, like a lot. Right. Well, in the, 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 the Canadian regime, uh, through the election, you could decide in which point of the Philip curve you decide to want to be. If you are a progressive, maybe you want, uh, you accept the higher inflation, but you want uh, lower unemployment. If you are a conservative, okay, you vote for the parties that want, want lower inflation and uh, high, higher employment. But, but there is real democracy in this. There is a left, and there, is a, there are progressives, and there are conservatives. And we differ in view of where it is uh, uh, desirable to be uh, along the field curve. Uh, why international Keynesis, not only national Keynesis, international Keynesis is essential because of the balance of payment problems. I mean, the most important uh, recent experience that they regard is the Mitterrand government in 1981. It was elected to a very progressive Keynesian uh, program, but that he had to give up uh, after a year and a half. Uh, because, uh, I mean, uh, an expansionary policy uh, in, in, in France uh, led to a balance of payment problem, and you import more from where? From Germany, of course, and, uh, and uh, because of the balance, Mitterrand did not want to value the French franc, and so Mitterrand had to abandon, because of the lack of cooperation of Germany, so I, I say Germany was the main uh, European uh, uh, important European country. So, uh, in traditional Germany has opposed international cases uh, and problem with Germany. There are reactions you can, uh, I mean, measures you can adopt, uh, like uh, trade controls. The great Federico Caffè and other economists, I would like to suggest you to, to go back to his uh, writings on exchange rate flexibility. Uh, it was part of the Canadian uh, international framework, uh, the case idea of the international, uh, international Canadian Union, and you can refer here to what Professor Amad and Professor Fantaggi have written about. Uh, tell me one more. Uh, why is Germany? Uh, Uh, why is Germany the, the European, uh, probably a global problem? Well, since the early uh, 50s, uh, Germany has deliberately, uh, one can produce important uh, uh, statements by uh, Herr, the, 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 the Minister of Finance of Germany at the time, he was the father of the German economic Michael, Germany to sue a neo mercantilist model that is uh, uh, an export talent. Um, the, the idea of the Germans was we are in a Bretton uh, fixed chain trade system, so not, the, the other countries cannot cannot uh, uh, value their currencies. The uh, other were not uh, were considered in the Bretton Woods system. Um, let, let France uh, and Britain, the United States, uh, adopt Canadian policies. Then we have uh, a high inflation rate, so they lose competitiveness. They expand their domestic demand, so they will import uh, more from us. Um, with uh, a fixed exchange rate regime, they cannot devalue. 
our exports will take off. I mean, this was the event. The event. Um, and which is the rationale of this, of this, of this, of this model. Well, we must go back uh, to Michael Kalevsky, which is uh, Keynes, uh, the Canadian, uh, the Marxist Keynes, and he, and he anticipated many years of Keynes when he was writing in, in, in Polish. But anyway, the, the great heterodox economist, uh, the idea is that uh, uh, with an export, with a mercantilist strategy, uh, Capitalists can have the best of both worlds. They can keep their uh, domestic wages relatively low, let's say behind productivity. Okay? Uh, of course, in Germany productivity was increasing a lot, but the idea was that wages should follow productivity, but you know, adelante pedro, not con giudizio, con giudizio, slowly. And so, but if you, I mean, if you, uh, you can repress uh, domestic wages, then the demand, aggregate demand, domestic aggregate demand suffers. Okay, uh, you will sell more abroad. Good quality, of course, of the German products, plus uh, price competitiveness. Uh, so, capitalists will have high profits because of the repressed uh, domestic wages. And they will, use the Marxist term, realize uh, these profits selling uh, excess of what they don't sell uh, uh, in the internal market, in the domestic bar market, they will sell a bro. Um, so the mercantilist strategies combines wage repression, high profits, and fixed exchange regime. This was called by the main leader, the economic historian, called uh, Walter Ferry, uh, monetary mercantilism. Uh, by the way, in uh, official publication of the Bundesbank, so it was a very important German economist, and uh, again, I'm not mad. Why Italy or France uh, accepted the uh, fixed exchange regime, regime with uh, Germany? First, with the European uh, monetary system in 1979 for Italy, and later with the Euro. Uh, well, the section is uh, not easy. I mean, Italy uh, was in a high inflation country. Uh, the devaluation of the Liga and, uh, and accommodating uh, uh, monetary policy by the Bank of Italy uh, okay, led the country to. Because it, this policy is. Okay, led, led uh, permitted, allowed a uh, higher inflation rate in Italy that was, uh, was accommodated by the devaluation of the Liga. More or less in some stop and go, but Italy in the 70s uh, was still growing, and the level of employment was uh, more or less uh, uh, preserved. Uh, well, it was not the best of all worlds. What happened in Italy in the 70s, uh, in the social conflict, what was, was too high, the responsibility was not only in the Italian Union, the responsibility, I think, especially on the bourgeoisie, the Italian bourgeoisie, the Italian bourgeoisie is the better. They are the guys, uh, my Italian friends will understand, is Mussolini, uh, is the repression in the 50s, uh, is the bombs of Piazza Fontana, is the Muscone, this is the Italian bourgeoisie. bourgeoisie. Uh, so it was not clever enough, the Italian bourgeoisie, to provide a social compromise uh, with, uh, with uh, the request coming from, the, from labor. So uh, the responsibility of this high social conflict. So instead, Italy, in any way, Italy was a great institutional failure. failure. I think that it's the bourgeoisie to blame. Um, uh, um, that is a social compromise uh, as we had in northern uh, European countries. So that, that the solution to this internal uh, conflict was, uh, <coughs> was uh, um, found in the external discipline. Huh? Tie your hands. Uh, I cannot, I don't want to enter in this, but I mean, it can be shown that the cause of the high Italian public debt is absolutely not the uh, fiscal profligacy by Italian governments, but uh, was precisely the foreign consumption. I mean, I cannot, if you want to debate the discussion, I can explain why, but there is a paper by Gennaro Zenz and me. Uh, 
uh, on this. I mean, the foreign cost gain, usually the standard deviation is uh, from fiscal deficit, uh, from some deviation from current account, uh, from fiscal deficit to current account deficit. Uh, we show that the uh, regulation go from the current account deficit due to the loss of, the loss, the loss of competitiveness uh, for people in the fixed exchange rate system. Uh, this could lead to a higher fiscal deficit and public debt. Public, public debt. Anyway, and, uh, okay, we will go on, uh, on many other uh, details. Uh, another part of the story, of, uh, I, don't, I don't stop there, but another part of the story of the European Monetary Union is that uh, as it happened in the gold standard, and the European Monetary Union is a sort of gold standard, we adopt a foreign country. Currency, in the case of the gold standard is gold, uh, and in the case of the European Union is the euro. Uh, uh, These this regimes can easily lead to financial uh, crisis, indebtedness of the periphery of the union, and uh, sudden stop of capital flows and financial crisis. And this was a, this was really unexpected. Who the go? Maybe say something about uh, this. Uh, this kind of problem. Uh, um, okay. Um, as you know, uh, an early uh, criticism about uh, the viability of the monetary union uh, in Europe uh, uh, came from Mandel. Uh, Mandel at the, at the time of the nation, maybe became very, very, very conservative, but at the time it was uh, my, my nation. And yet the German in mind, I mean, you, you cannot uh, have a, in, in a note, a footnote uh, in 1961, you mentioned Germany as an example. Uh, in a, a monetary union be, between non-homogeneous countries would let this lead to a competitiveness shocks in the periphery and to the refusal of the core country I had, I had the German in mind to expand. So you have a deflationary bias in uh, uh, monetary union. Uh, in Europe, uh, this Mandel had in mind, you know, Mandel uh, was commenting a discussion that was going on in Europe already at the time about the possibility of monetary union. Uh, a full uh, viable monetary union implies a federal budget assisted by a cooperative central bank, like in the United States. The United States has a viable monetary union. I want to, uh, uh, in the sense that, uh, look at this, uh, at this uh, at graph. Uh, this is the European Union. These are the national budgets, uh, taxes, uh, revenues, and uh, expenditure. It doesn't matter. It's uh, about almost 50% on average of the, the size of the public spending on GDP. And this is uh, less than uh, less than one percent is the federal budget of the European Union. In the United States, you see you have uh, uh, now the federal budget, yeah, the price is very high. This is the uh, federal budget which is over 20 percent now it's even more and these are the national uh, budgets. So you have a huge federal budget in the United States that consists most of, mostly of redistribution between states Okay, uh, with a lot of media spending, which is also, we don't like it, but it's very delicious. And, uh, and uh, the rest uh, is the distribution for, and the, and the, the differences between the American states are not so high as the differences, uh, uh, as the gaps uh, with the capital income that we have in Europe. Nonetheless, I mean, most of that uh, budget is, uh, uh, consists of the risk. So that, that is a viable. Then they have a banking union, real banking union. If there is a local banking crisis, it's not the local state that put the money, okay? But it's a federal, an agency at the federal level. And then, be sure, there is a Maastricht treaty in the United States. A Maastricht treaty makes sense. I mean, uh, when the local state has not the central bank, uh, they, have, they are obliged to a balanced budget. I mean, because they, if they violated the balanced budget, they can say it. That's true. Uh, uh, of course, no country, no government will 
uh, sovereign uh, um, uh, central bank uh, can fail. Eh? Okay, if you are your central bank, you can fail. You can generate, you can monetize them, but you can create inflation, what you like, but I mean, you not fail. Uh, okay, we understand there is a mass activity, but at the same time, there is a lot of redistribution from the richest state to the uh, poorest state. States. So, I mean, uh, the mass activity makes sense, okay, but you have, must complete the union with a, a distribution, and not a distribution of zero point, I mean, a huge redistribution. Now, is this is a federal euro? Is this possible Europe? No. I mean, for good reason, and I don't uh, blame them, the Germans, or the, or the, uh, or the Dutch, or the Finnish, don't want a tax, what they call a tax transfer uh, system. They don't want to pay uh, that their taxes goes to, 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 to finance Italy or Russia or Greece or uh, to be honest I don't want uh, their money. I would like my my currency back actually, uh, but not their money. Uh, so is this a, a, a viable monetary union in Europe possible? No. I mean uh, that, this point was very clearly made by Hayek in a paper in nineteen thirty nine against discussing the possibility, feasibility of uh, uh, federal uh, Europe, uh, he said, uh, the only, what Hayek said, the only possible European uh, uh, Union, federal Union, is a very liberal, uh, uh, in the European sense, uh, uh, Union, let's say, uh, uh, with no redistribution, with no tax transfer system, because of course the, the main countries will, will refuse this, uh, uh, this, uh, this answer. So, I mean, uh, uh, I think that there is no, no uh, federal union view, a progressive federal, uh, federal union, European Union. I mean, the possibility, of course, is to go ahead with the present, which is what the high had in mind, the liberal and neoliberal law. So now people like to say it was the first time to the word liberalism in Italy uh, in uh, 2010, uh, they call it uh, auto liberal. But I mean, this is it's the only Europe we can have actually. The Germans don't, don't want to change it. They say no to the timid proposal. Right now. 
So how would you say, how would you compare the living standards that the EU provides to the people? So that's the question. How would you, what would you say about the comparison between uh, the living standards that the EU provides to its people compared to the US federal government? Of course, the EU is not a federal government yet, but I think that's what you meant like in the first part to get to it. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, my question is that um, we saw that one of the big, biggest problems in the European area is unemployment. So my question is, would it be a good idea to give also the task to the European Central Bank of full employment like the Federal Reserve or, or not? And we saw, of course, that uh, unemployment is one of the biggest problems and the threats that give power to populist um, powers. So, uh, I would like to uh, ask to Professor Brim also to Professor Cinerato if he wants to, to answer. Um, you uh, mentioned that the the constituency of the economic union was a rule-based uh, constituency. And why, according to you, so much effort has put, uh, especially in the, in the beginning, on controls on public debts and from my point of view, very much on external debts, which maybe in the monetary union might be still a quite important issue, maybe more than public debts. Thank you. Consumption, private expenditure, let's say, depends a lot on income distribution. If you if you have higher wages and lower profits, you have higher demand because the propensity to spend out of wages is higher than the propensity to spend out of profits because profits go to richer people that have a smaller propensity to spend. Okay. Now this is an example, but there were many uh, problems. That connected with income distribution in the reasoning of uh, uh, many economists also you know, uh, that, that, that were not adhering to a school in a, uh, in a dogmatic way. And in fact, we have been uh, considering macroeconomics for too much time 
as something else from uh, income distribution. So, and today we discovered that income distribution is crucial for macroeconomic, uh, uh, it comes back. And, um, and for instance, if you look at the, at the uh, World Economic Outlook, which has been issued by the IMF a uh, couple of days ago, it has a full chapter, very thick and very interesting, on uh, the markup. That is the difference between variable cost, wages, and raw materials, and prices uh, all over the place in the world. And there is a tremendous evidence that markups are increasing enormously, which uh, pushes down the remuneration of labor in particular, while increases the amount of resources that are decided upon by firms. So the, the power to decide what to do with resources has been shifting and keeps shifting uh, to the, the firms, basically, to the managers of the firms. And, and this, is a, this is a new frontier for, uh, also for the IMF, for instance. They want to enter deeply into this discussion. And try to Obviously, you have to, if you want to have a policy that meets this, this challenge, you have to go for a strong competition policy. Because the reason why the markups are increasing is that there is too much monopoly power. So you need international integration, you need a lot of attention for competitiveness, for uh, uh, competition policies, and so on and so forth. And there are uh, you know, discussions on the level of wages in Germany today are uh, mm, mainstream, I would say. The government is deeply uh, worried about the fact that for many, many, <coughs> For a long period, wages have not been increasing enough in Germany, which has prevented a lot, uh, prevented the, uh, the internal demand to, uh, to increase and has uh, created this uh, disequilibria in, in Germany. Uh, things are changing, and the government is deeply devoted to change them, but we don't have a good analytical apparatus as policy makers, as macroeconomists, as to deal in a you know, in a systematic way uh, with these issues. So uh, it is true that uh, some of uh, what we have uh, pushed uh, towards our friends, we, we always had colleagues who were specialists in income distribution, but they were sort of in, in a corner there. And uh, 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 macroeconomists that always, they were more near to microeconomists than to macroeconomists. We macroeconomists, we were on the other side of the corridor, so to speak. And this has to uh, probably cease, and, and we, we have to try seriously to uh, 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 integrate uh, issues of income distribution with uh, policy, uh, macro, microeconomic policy. Let me now answer quickly to at least one of the questions that was, uh, uh, that was uh, made. Uh, oh, why, why public debt? Well, as I, as I said, uh, we, I, I tried to explain to tell you the story of why the rule of public debt was introduced when, when the single currency was introduced. It was an, a direct consequence of the fact that uh, with a single currency you cannot reimburse your debt. Uh -huh. with, a, with a single currency you cannot reimburse your debt. If you, don't, if you cannot pay the currency, you cannot guarantee to be able to reimburse your debt. So, so this was, uh, this was the reason why the single currency there was the risk of uh, the fall on debt, which was a problem for everything. But, uh, but there is another reason why public debt is still at the center of many of these rules. Because, the, because in the democracies do not care about future generations. And there is clearly a bias towards not only short termism, but also current generations versus future generations. So there is a tendency in all policy decisions to put the burden of decisions of today on the shoulders of future generations. And in order to prevent this from happening, you have only one method, you know, international rules, or rules that, uh, uh, constitutional rules. We, we ended up putting it in our constitution. It doesn't make very much of a difference, but anyway, 
we, we, we need to commit the political uh, forces to something that is not taken care of by their own interests. So uh, this, is, this is the reason. We are going in monetary policy. This is a very complex issue I want to enter in. Let me only say that the central bank is deeply caring about unemployment. Officially, uh, all its decisions can be justified in terms of pushing mid in the medium long term price stability, etc. This is a nice story under which uh, the central bank does a lot of policies, including it. And it is not true, by the way, that, that that the central bank thinks that monetary policy is neutral. They, they, they know that monetary policy is extremely important. Uh, they, they, they know that the interest rates have a limited impact on investment, but they know that there are many other channels through which the central bank can influence investment and consumption. So they, they also influence income distribution in many ways when they change interest rates and they buy public bonds. So, uh, they are very much aware of the complexity of the issue and uh, that the decisions of central banks are taken, okay, in a technocratic way, but, you know, countries participate in the central banks. So it is not true that the single currency is giving up in the, the monetary autonomy. We do have a lot of autonomy, more than, for instance, uh, uh, you know, uh, Poland. Poland has monetary authority on its uh, small, uh, uh, on its small uh, you know, monetary market. In, 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 in the Italians participate directly into the managing of European monetary policy, which influences a much larger group of, of citizens. And so we also influence monetary policy that influences other countries. So the single currency is not a decision to give up monetary autonomy, on the contrary, is the only way to exercise some power because monetary policy, if you try to do it alone, you end up, uh, uh, it's, it's got to be insane. And, and this is what we experienced during the 70s and during the 80s when we were obliged to follow the Bundesbank. And, uh, uh, because there was no other way to do it. Oh yeah, sure. This is the okay. Okay, if we isolate our countries, which is the dream of many nationalists and protectionists today, if we isolate our countries, this is good. At that point you are really autonomous. You are a bit alone, perhaps you're gonna also be a bit poor, uh, but uh, but you are autonomous. At that point you are Yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, about uh, uh, the capital theory controversy, uh, I invite you to read something about that. Uh, I'll tell you, of course, John Robinson was a disaster. I mean, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the capital theory controversy, the controversy between the cabbages was about, the uh, equation was about uh, 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 formal theory. Uh, then John Robinson was very imaginative, uh, really, but I mean, uh, she put, uh, you know, Confusion in the debate, actually. She had something from Zaf at the beginning of the 50s, a broken article on Zaf, as they thought it was a disaster. So, I mean, it was an analytic, but not an ideological thing, uh, The first question about Sandra Gobini in the US, and uh, I mean, what can I say? What I would say is that, uh, of course, I think that the European model, uh, based on welfare state, uh, on the welfare state was superior to the American model. Uh, um, uh, and I believe, I firmly believe that uh, uh, the European Monetary Union has been built, built precisely to destroy this model, in spite of you know, the, the money they spend in advertising, uh, you know, they are defending the Because it, why? Why the uh, European social model was based on Dependent sovereign states. I mean, the sovereign states, the, the national democracies, are the uh, playing field of the social conflict and of, uh, of national democracies. I mean, when you uh, uh, when you uh, uh, delegate uh, uh, too many powers to supranational uh, institutions, you give up democracy and you give up the possibility to fight for a better society. I mean, you ask me, well, I mean, somebody, in French intellectual, I forgot the name, said that the, the word uh, liberal, liberalism, uh, in Europe was unpopular, so they invented the word Europe. Okay, to do the same policies. Um, about the employment, I mean, I think we firmly believe that uh, it's an issue here to have a, a status similar to, to the Federal Reserve. I mean, with the press stability for employment uh, as uh, two main targets. Uh, and then the democratically uh, vote. Uh, because I mean, the, the, the Fed then responds to the Congress. It's not uh, so independent like, uh, uh, like the ECB. And so you vote, and you vote also, you want uh, to give more weight to for employment or more weight to inflation. I mean, this is democracy. This is democracy. But in Europe, this is called fiscal. And then you need fiscal money. Fiscal policy, of course. I mean, monetary policy is uh, uh, should be served, should be a subsidiary to uh, support the fiscal policy. It's called in, in Europe uh, fiscal dominance. Yes, I am for the fiscal dominance, of course. Um, public uh, debt, and as we extend on that. I mean, the way in which he's talking, read uh, what uh, Blanchard is writing in, uh, in the last weeks about the, the public debt. I mean, as long as this, uh, well, we have no time, this equation that, uh, that uh, uh, rules uh, uh, the, the dynamic of the, of the public debt, uh, and the two variables are uh, important. The rate of nominal real, the, the, I have nominal values for the real, it's, it's, it's the nominal rate of growth of the economy, this is the nominal rate of interest, uh, nominal rate of interest on the public debt. And all the dynamic, I mean, as long as the nominal interest rate is lower than the nominal growth rate, Blanchard is saying very clearly public debt has never been a problem. I mean, in Italy, public debt is a problem because we have the nominal interest rate, which is higher than the... the this caused, this caused the, the, the higher nominal interest rate higher than the nominal rate of growth, caused the explosion of the public debt in the 80s. And we had to keep the nominal interest rates high because of the membership in the European monetary system. Okay, so I mean, uh, the, the search of the foreign constraint of the external DCP returned with the disaster of, of the public debt. I mean, uh, it was not, a, and we used the money very badly. I mean, they still don't do this country. I'm not saying, all the failures of Europe, and we had to explain the institutional failure. Um, so, I mean, if I ask you to suggest something, uh, something that also 
the chief economist uh, of the Dutch Bank uh, for the excellent hours that was proposed. There's a green bank game between Italy and uh, Europe, uh, in which we, we assure, uh, we guarantee the stability, the stability, we believe stability of the, G, of the public bank of GDP ratio, because there is not much number, there is no reason why we go back to 60% or, or to go, we can go to 250 like in Japan. Uh, note that we don't have Italy has not an excellent debt, negative excellent debt. Spain has a 90% of the GDP of excellent debt. Italy has not an excellent debt in this moment, negative excellent debt. Um, uh, so there is no margin. I mean, you know, the debt is because of the state policies and the delayed intervention of ECB. You now the debt is 130% uh, of the GDP. Okay, keep the discussion there. As long as the, the ECB uh, keep the uh, it, nominal interest rate of Italian public debt or euro bonds or whatever you like, or a combination of these policies, lower than the rate of growth, we can even afford, because there is a third variable that matters, which is the primary balance, or primary budget balance, with a very low interest rate at the, the French level. In France has an external debt and has uh, the public debt is 90% of the GDP, so it's not so, so small. Uh, we, we have the nominal interest rate of France. We can afford uh, a primary deficit, so we could support domestic demand, the GDP would grow, so we can have the best of the both worlds, stabilization of the GDP, of the debt GDP ratio, and some growth. Uh, we also need to go some expansion in policy structure that uh, is very difficult to hold. Stability is an important target of economic policy. 
policy is. Especially in a world uh, like the one we have, we live in, where finance is pervasive, with a highly fine, with a high, we have a lot of financial infrastructure, perhaps too much. So in a, in a, in a world which, where finance is so important, financial stability is one of the most important ta uh, uh, targets if you want to preserve uh, uh, the economy from tremendous redistributive shocks. And by the way, let me say, uh, connecting to what we were discussing before about the, the targets of the central bank, unemployment, inflation, etc., that in my view, uh, I know I have a lot of friends in, in the central bank. I, I, I know what they do from the morning to night. And I assure you that 80% at least of their time is devoted to financial stability. Forget about price stability. They, they have been not caring very much about it in the last uh, you know, 10 years practically because inflation problems were, were not there. They, they were pretending to try to increase inflation, but uh, they knew perfectly that it was not in their possibilities. So they, their time, efforts, fantasy, research, uh, the, you know, the orders they gave to the research department, the publications, etc., actions, uh, mm, uh, uh, actions on politicians, etc., they are mainly concentrated on uh, preventing banks from failing, preventing the excess of debt which is around to go to create a, a, a disaster uh, like, like uh, it has happened in 2008, etc. This is the true target of the central bank, and not only of the ECB, it's also the target of the Fed, it is the target of the Bank of England, it has been the target for, for a lot of time also of, of the Bank of Japan. Uh, so, uh, uh, this is the first redistribution. Second redistribution possibility, via public goods. In my view, the big redistribution that can take place in a modern economy is by producing a lot of very good public goods. Uh, and this is what Europe should do. And this is what Europe is trying to plan um, for the future. We are now starting to discuss, as you probably know, the multi-annual financial framework of the European Union, which will give the strategy of the, of the, of the budget of the European Union from, from 2021 to 2027. Uh, there's been a lot of work on that, and the decision was taken to give up the idea of in, increasing the size of the budget, because this is politically unfeasible. So it, it, the budget will, will be increased by just a little bit. But the decision was taken to change a lot, possibly, if, uh, if this will be allowed by the Council and by the Parliament, uh, uh, change a lot the quality of the budget. Of course, in the, uh, in, the, uh, you know, in the positive and the negative items. In particular, <coughs> We would like to put a lot of resources in producing European public goods, genuine European public goods, like defense, security, management, management of uh, 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 migrations, uh, 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 fundamental research, which is not uh, in the, you know, it's, it's a long-term thing, so, uh, so short-term oriented governments uh, forget about uh, fundamental research. Uh, fundamental research is not applied research, okay? It's fundamental research. So a big budget for that. Uh, uh, there, there's a big uh, increase planned for, uh, you know, Erasmus uh, type of affairs, etc. These are public, European public goods, and given that public goods are mostly for the benefit of weaker people and poorer people because richer and stronger people can, in a way, do without a lot of public goods. If, if I have a nice uh, street, well maintained, etc., and a very rich guy with a big terrace and, you know, a big apartment, I, I just don't care about the street. If I am, if I have a small apartment, uh, it's just, just be, I want the street to be neat. So the, the neatness of streets, which is a typical public good, is much more important for poor people than for, for rich people. And this is what we have to do in Europe. We have to, to produce a lot of public goods. 
And this will also change a little bit the view on what the European Union is. Because when you produce a public good, you don't produce it for one country. You produce it for everybody, by definition. They are indivisible public goods. And therefore, we hope with this, it would be hopeful at least, but this is one of the reasons why this strategic decision has been taken, that this will help to stop this strange discussion about the dog deaths between countries and the Union. You know, the British started saying we, we give some money to the European Union, we get back less, etc. You have to, re we need a rebate, etc. But now, if you look at those uh, nationalist governments, they all go for the same accounts. But these accounts are illegitimate. They don't make sense, especially if with the money that the, co the Commission is, that the European Union is able to collect, you produce public goods for everybody. So it, 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 the dog test calculation is, 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 is disappears. Finally, let me remember, recall that the, the Italian government has produced a nice document which has been appreciated in Bruxelles. Then we have changed the government, etc. And now nobody defends what we did in the past, which is a proposal for an unemployment insurance fund. Uh, in, that would help countries that are hit by asymmetric shocks to unemployment of a cyclical nature, not of a structural nature. And uh, uh, the, the idea of funding this unemployment insurance fund is still in the papers of Brussels. Uh, it's a bit, uh, it's gone a bit uh, down in the papers of Brussels, but the hopes to bring it back are not completely without uh, uh, possibilities. If, if our diplomacy, would, international diplomacy, would be in a better condition than we have, we would, this, would, this is the, would be the right moment to insist on that and to obtain that euro officially. This would have a lot of impact also on the public opinion because it would be clear that Europe is caring about unemployment. Uh, so with a little money, because you don't need an enormous amount of money for that, with a little money we could have a very, very precious uh, contribution of Europe to uh, solidarity. Okay, thank you. Uh, I answered the question about the possibility of uh, <coughs> abolishing unemployment capitalism. Financial crisis in the bread of goods system, you have no financial crisis. Why? Because the work capital controls. I know that you expect to work in the financial system, so if we destroy or uh, we use the <laughs> investment financial system, you, will, uh, <laughs> you cannot work anymore in these uh, well paid jobs. I'm sorry for you, but I'm uh, not sorry for me. Um, so, no, no. Uh, no uh, capital flows, no financial crisis. Um, you should pursue European public goods. Uh, first, public goods are employment, full employment, and the welfare state. We are destroying them. And anyway, uh, with public goods in Europe, you need the distribution, the tax transfers, or to help Italy, I mean, have the currency back and pursue his own policies. And uh, in employment insurance, I mean, the, the Germans say clearly, say, no, the German and Dutch say clearly, you know, to my home. Why they should say, we don't read the Italian uh, proposal. Uh, of course, uh, there might be some progressive Germans that is interested. I mean, uh, but, I mean uh, it's a very easy proposal then. It's not a change of the regime. You know. Well, about full employment in capitalism, I'm very pessimist. Uh, there is one mass reading uh, for any uh, you know, serious economist, which is the political aspect of foreign policy taken by Michael Kalecki in uh, 1943, which explained very well uh, why uh, capitalism and unemployment, unfortunately, are, uh, are inconsistent. Uh, because, I mean, foreign policy means uh, uh, this is a uh, strong bargaining power of the liberal class of the uh, trade union. And this is so, I mean, the, uh, the, uh, the good function in capitalism with uh, inflation, etc., needs uh, a, uh, the pool of unemployed people, what Marx called the industrial reserve army. Let's see, so there is a. Then you can have social compromise.
Yeah, man. Sorry, uh, I'm fast. So actually, now that they all in Italy talk about you know austerity, but we actually never had austerity. The country that had austerity, now they're growing. You can see the GDP is going down, and the unemployment is going down. In Italy, like we are, I think we are going much, we are dealing much more uh, problems with the euro, but actually are endogenous problems. The final question for Professor Bruni, short question for a short answer. Uh, in the USA, a civil war was needed in order to obtain the constitution and the democratic system. Uh, the European community finds its first expression in a settlement that supports the trade of carbon and steel among countries. Can, could this not so political genesis be a cause for euroscepticism? This is a question from uh, readers of our newspaper. Uh, no, I have appreciated the question by a German friend. Um, I mean, I have no feeling uh, in Germany and uh, I appreciate the French and the Germans. Um, uh, no, I am not. I'm pretty simple. I'm playing Germany in a sense, uh, but I mean, I'm in a tradition of uh, uh, blaming the macro policies of Germany, of blaming German neo capitalism. <coughs> the, 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 the question is, is a polemic of the Germany, the critique of Germany, started in the very beginning of the 50s. Uh, so it's not, nothing new under the sun. I mean, it came as a the discussion uh, about the, uh, the, the, the locomotives uh, was called. I mean, in the world economy, in the late 70s, the Americans said, uh, we don't want to be the only locomotive or the only engine of the world economy. Uh, uh, Germany and uh, Japan must also uh, 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 pull the world economy. They should stop to be, uh, you know, cars. Uh, and we are the only engines. So, I mean, there is a long, long, long tradition of criticism in this aspect for Germany. But I'm not blaming Germany because Ger the Ger Germans refuse a tax transfer system. I mean, uh, uh, the, the, the Liga Nord until a uh, few months ago, uh, you know, want, I mean, they won now in Italy. The, 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 the Lombardy and Veneto want more autonomy. Fiscal autonomy, they want to uh, reduce the, the transfers from the north of uh, Italy to the south. And uh, uh, Barcelona is fed up of uh, subsiding uh, uh, Madrid. So I, I fully understand, I, said that. I, I fully understand that the, the, the German, I'm not blaming uh, what I'm saying, but uh, they are Germans, they are Italians, they are French. If you want a viable uh, 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 monetary union, I understand that it's the way. We don't want. Uh, the tax council system, okay, but keep uh, to find a way to give the currency back to the, the countries, because, especially because Germany is a particular country, because of this tradition of neo capitalism. So, how we must react? Uh, we must be autonomous, otherwise, and, and not everybody can be German, because I mean, uh, where, where do we sell? If everybody wants to export and not import, where do we sell? Okay, we can sell. Uh, Outside, the, outside the Europe, but I mean, we are destabilizing the world economy. And then Trump reacts and says, We have to go on. I mean, come on, you, you know, this is a, a not viable Europe. That's it. I mean, you can some, do some maquillage, I mean, but I mean, this is uncertain. I let you go in a, you do like the United States, or uh, with uh, defending the social Europe, of course. <laughs> Go back to the international cases made of in uh, independent states. I mean, uh, that's uh, is my opinion. Uh, can, can Italy be worse with, uh, with its own currency? Go back. I mean, we, we need an institutional, institutional change in Italy, a social compromise. I mean, uh, we have a lot of homework to do. I mean, this, uh, this, is a, this country is a disaster. First, first of all, to have a, a serious uh, ruling class. I mean, all the governments uh, from Berlusconi to Monti to Letta to Corenzi to uh, Salvini di Maia, I mean, this is not uh, very serious people. I mean, uh, probably Italian have a lot of uh, 
you know, the world rule and etc. I mean, to change countries is very difficult. In a sense, I, but in a sense, I would prefer it rather growing with a higher inflation, with the less, uh, with lira, but growing with the, 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 the employment increase that uh, the German, uh, Italy, that is uh, you know, falling, stagnating, declining, and uh, you know, becoming a customer. Thank you. Before I, I answer, let me say one thing on independence of monetary policies when you have your own currency. Look at the case of the UK. The UK has had almost its own currency, but I wouldn't define monetary policy in the UK. They, they had a choice to follow the ECD or to follow the Fed. And they practically made an average, except when the European monetary policy was strong enough to, uh, to close any other alternative for the British, but to follow uh, the ECD. So that you cannot have any independence if you don't put control. It's right. If you imagine that in a modern world where we have those incredible linkages in finance, I'm talking about a developed Europe, I'm not talking about South America, because as, as uh, he has also recalled, even the IMF has uh, concluded that in certain de uh, uh, developing countries, capital controls are to be uh, used in several situations. But I'm talking about core Europe. I don't think it's materially possible to, uh, to, to, uh, to, uh, to introduce the capital controls in our, in our economy. And this would end up giving more powers to a political class that, frankly, I don't, uh, I, I don't trust very much. But, uh, and the same thing if you look at Denmark. Denmark has always followed the, the, uh, the, the exchange rate, has committed to stay in the fixed. Poland is just moving into the state exactly as we do. Uh, it's, it's, it's the rule. And we do, we are in, in fact following this, the United States. Monetary policy is really done at the global level by the United States. And this is also the type of model that I'm now using in Washington. I mean, there's these uh, <coughs> global financial cycles that are prevailing in the uh, econometric analysis of the fund, where basically the Fed is does monetary policy for everything. So either we separate and segment all the capital markets in the world, or we have to reach a consensus and get together and do what Keynes wanted to do, that is a real coordination of monetary policy, coming even to us. I mean, the dream of Keynes was in a single currency for the world. I, I don't want to exaggerate, and I know that he, he was meaning, uh, uh, you know, a lot of things. But, <laughs> yes, but, uh, but, but, I mean, this, this is really uh, the, the, the fact. Uh, on uh, Germany and Italy and competitiveness and things like that, remember that today there is no contrast between the commercial trade success of Germany and the commercial trade success of Italy. I mean, most of German exports have an enormous contempt of Italian imports. So the competitiveness of Germany is what we need to export more. There is no conflict of interest between the competitors of the two countries. Basically, we don't compete in any important markets. You can, you can look at carefully market by market, sector by sector. There's, if we really want to look at these couple of countries, there are other couple of countries where there are conflicts of competitiveness in Europe between us and, and for instance, between Italy and Italy and France, there are competitive problems. With Italy, between Italy and Germany, it's very, very small. Uh, finally, uh, no, I, I see two little things. One, uh, are we too diverse to have a single union and even a single currency? Let me just point to you to one paper, which I think is very, very interesting. It's a paper by Travellini and others, which is, the title is, optimal, is, is Europe an optimal political area? 
And what they do, they look at ideological uh, data, about the ideas of people, about, you know, from sex to politics to religion to uh, etc. And they, they, they have an enormous amount of data. And, they, and the conclusion they get, it's extremely interesting because there is, there is a, a lot of differences between cultures in Europe. But the differences are inside each of our countries. So the problem of cultural differences is a problem of our living together, but it's not a problem that really makes Italians different from Germans, different from France. Yes, we are different, obviously. But these differences are much more inside each of our countries. This is why also political problems happen inside our countries. This is why populism has roots inside each of our countries. Because we, are, we have conflicts among us. We don't settle our national problems. It's not a problem of international relations. Europe could help each of our countries to solve its own problems or consensus inside by making the problems more clear and coping with them with a co cooperation, okay? Because this is the, this is the, finally, the most uh, classical question. Uh, what about Europe having started by economics instead of starting by our political so the, we, we, we did this, we did this, even, even if we wanted to do differently, because we started from the fact of, you know, that we're, we were coming out from war, so the idea was to reach a political consensus, a political unity. But then we, said, we, we decided that this was impossible to complicate it. There were clearly parts of Europe that didn't want to, to, to accept this. And so we started step by step with this model uh, that was signed particularly by Jean Monnet, which was called functionalism. We started from small economic decisions with the idea that this would drive us towards political unity. Uh, now, I think that in part this was successful. For many years this was successful. We were able to build a substantial Europe. I mean, Europe is a really big thing at the global level. We are doing a lot of things together. And it's working, but with a limit. Now I think we are in the moment where we cannot go on, go on any longer if we don't uh, try hard to do something rather smart and rather deep political uh, uh, steps in Europe, which are not easy to decide. For instance, this idea of working on the budget for seven years and trying to qualify public expenditure in public goods, it would be a tremendously important political decision. So we must be extremely sophisticated in looking to the future of Europe. It's a difficult task to put together so many political classes that are, you know, have interests that are clearly divergent because each of them wants the votes of their own electorates and they want to look you know more smart than the others moreover they are not they, they have to fight against other parties in the same country so they try to put the enemy outside so it's a very complicated business and we have to go with extremely smart people extremely smart ideas and a lot of gradualism but i i recognize and i am fully uh, Nice. And now, the energy that was in the Monet model of functionalism has been exhausted. I mean, there's nothing to do. We cannot go further if we don't do some crucial political steps, which are not probably, you know, to, to, to build up a federation from one moment to the other. It, it, it's simply that we have to make small but political steps. Small, gradual, smart, but political steps, like the unemployment insurance, like the public budget, like the common army, this would be extremely effective also at the global level and with the public opinion, like something on you know, uh, migration, which is a problem that is uh, uh, creating troubles everywhere. We have to do this smart, small, progressive and well-designed uh, uh, well political steps. If we don't go in these directions, 
economic, you know, I, I, I'm a monetary economist, I, I take my, I spend my time on bank, banking problems, interest rates, finance, etc. So all my colleagues, uh, what, 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 we, what we work about is banking union, capital markets union, all this stuff. I'm conscious that this is useless. I mean, we, I, I, I work because this is my work. But, uh, but I know that these things that are important will never go on if we don't first show that we want to do some deep political steps. Uh, but this political step is not easy to detect. And not easy to talk. We need also very fine political leaders. If we don't have the good leader that indicates the right target for the, and, and is able to get the consensus around this target, well, it will never go on. And if we don't build Europe, well, if we don't build Europe, I'm sorry, but in the future, all practically all European countries will be, will be in trouble in a world which is, is going to, to, you know, to cover up and to destroy Europe and to we will lose power. So we have to build Europe, but it's very difficult to do it. So I hope you, young people, full of energy and new ideas, will help us do it. Thank you. Thank you for your questions, for your passions, so have a good evening.